All right, so this is chapter two, copyright law in the digital age. And what we are looking at in this chapter will be an introduction to intellectual property law in terms of comparing and contrasting uh, copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. Uh, yet, we'll also be focusing on copyright law, which stands at the forefront of the legal issues related to the Internet. And we'll also be focusing on the scope of copyright protection, copyright notice, copyright registration, copyright dur duration, uh, and the fair use defense. Uh, we'll also look uh, very briefly to uh, look at the DMCA, which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that will uh, give us an idea about the safe harbor uh, defense. Uh, the idea to understand more intellectual property is because the internet and technology or uh, the IT law, they are very much related to the types of intellectual property, uh, mainly to copyright and trademarks, as we'll see. But there's also a strong relation to trade secrets and patents. So um, in the first half of the course, we'll be basically looking at the various types of intellectual property. And what is intellectual property? Well, actually intellectual property is one type, is one category of uh, personal uh, property and this category is of personal property is related to intangible property so property we cannot touch we cannot hold those are intangible uh, items and more technically speaking or uh, better defined, we would say they are intangible rights. So rights we do not touch, but we have rights. And those rights, intellectual property rights, they will protect uh, products of the human intellect. So of human creation, of human discovery and commercially they will be protected such as new drugs we are now uh, in the year of 2020 living in this covid 19 moment and companies are searching for a vaccine for drugs that are efficient and those companies may have their um, discoveries their inventions uh, protected eventually by uh, patent also trademark we don't know but they are creations of the mind and those creations of the mind they are uh, protected they are known as intellectual property and types of them are copyright trademark patent trade secrets and others so we'll be looking at each of those um, in the chapters uh, forward. But now just to have an idea, uh, copyright will offer protection to authors of original works. And those original works, they have to be in a tangible form. So I told you that intellectual property will be an intangible, intangible, right? Intangible property. But copyright will only protect what we create when it is in a tangible form. What am I saying here? I'm saying that I thought about a book 
while this book, the draft of, of this book is in my mind, it is not protected by copyright because in my mind is not in a tangible form. But after I write it down, regardless if I have published it or not, but once I put it in a physical format, I type, I write it down handwriting, or I dictate, then this physical form of my creation may be protected by copyright. But we'll see this in more details. Whereas a trademark, a trademark may be a, a word, name, symbol, that will be used to indicate the origin or quality or ownership of a product or of a service. So we are all aware of the um, golden arches of McDonald's. It's a trademark. We're all aware of uh, Starbucks trademark, Coke, uh, Coke trademark. So they exist to help consumers to identify where the product or service comes from, okay? Whereas patents, patents, they are related to a process, to a discovery in which the process of that discovery will be protected. So let's say I discovered a way or I discovered the cure for COVID-19. So that's what I'm, I'm gonna apply for a patent. So I will have a patent protection, not a copyright, not a trademark. Maybe the name of the drug could be protected by trademark, but the method of manufacturing the drug may be protected by patent. Well, other examples would be uh, if you have a smartphone, a smartphone with a touch screen, the touch screen is protected by patent. By the way, Apple and Samsung, they had a lawsuit. They had a battle over this patent. Who owned the patent? Whether Samsung had infringed Apple's patent for the touch screen or not. And Apple won this battle they got an award of over half a billion dollars so in our smartphone there may be dozens of patents touch screen and several other things in our smartphone and then trade secrets so trade secrets they are any business information mostly the valuable business information that will make the holder of that information because we cannot call the owner of the information. No one owns information. People, businesses, they do hold information, either in secret or not, but they don't own information. No one owns information. So a trade secret will be any valuable business information that is held by a business, by a person, that would make them have a competitive advantage over their competitors. Two very famous trade secrets, Coke, and the other one is the sauce, KFC sauce. So they have, nev they have not been patented, so the process to make them could have been patented, but companies or people at that time, they decided not to patent. As we'll see in the future, patent has a validity time has a time in which the patent is, uh, the protection of patent is valid. After that time, it goes into public domain. Whereas trade secrets, they are valid as long as you keep it as a secret. So we can say that until um, nowadays, Coke has been very successful protecting their uh, main soda. Uh, trade secret and they have been protected protecting it so well that several other companies have already tried to manufacture similar pop they may get close but not the very the same and well 
I'm suspicious to uh, comment because uh, I'm a coke addict. Uh, but see, as long as they keep it a secret, they don't own the information. They only hold this information, keep it in secret, and then they have a uh, competitive advantage over all other companies. Okay, but we'll see all those in details. The main uh, aspects of this first part is first, you should understand that intellectual property is a type of personal property and it is a type related to the intangible rights. So, things with rights we cannot touch, intangible rights, they are the creation of the human uh, mind. And they are divided, intellectual property is divided into copyright, trademark, patents, and trade secrets. And those types, they protect different things. So a smartphone, I'm going to use iPhone as an example. An iPhone will have a, at least one patent, the touchscreen. We'll have a trademark, the Apple trademark. We'll also have copyright protection for the uh, manual the user's manual. So you see three different types of IP related to one product. There may also be some trade secrets, how they manufacture or whatever it is. See, so you have to understand that several different types of IP because they may, they may be alone or in uh, along with other types uh, related to one specific product or service. All right, so moving on, um, let's go a bit deeper in terms of copyright, because this is the first type of IP, and IP stands for intellectual property, uh, that we'll look into um, in this course. So IP, um, IP, sorry, copyright. Copyright gives authors protection for their web design. So if you design um, your own website, because it is a code, you are actually um, coming up with a code. So that is protected by copyright. Texts you have in your website, images, photographs, audios, they are all protected by copyright. Again, as long as they are original, works if you are getting it from someone else they are not original anymore okay they may they may be also protected by copyright but this protection may belong to someone else uh, software software is also protected by copyright some countries are already accepting software to be patented but very few countries so far so this is something i will not discuss here now but you may want to go uh, research a bit about uh, software patents that are specific requirements. Um, so in the US it's possible, here in Canada not yet. Uh, but So you can go um, research a bit more about this. But generally, software is protected by copyright, okay? Video games are also protected by copyright. And if you uh, <clears throat> refer to um, other examples I, I could give you, uh, such as uh, motion pictures, the uh, recording, sound recordings, uh, when you take a picture, that uh, picture is uh, protected by copyright, uh, so on and so forth. But remember, it has to be in a physical form. It has to be in a tangible form. So if you have an idea about a song, you actually have to write this song, write it down or sing it. Then it becomes protected. Okay. The idea of the song itself is not protected uh, by copyright. Uh, moving on, we have what is called the derivative works. So the de derivative works, they are works that are based on pre-existing work. 
And the best example here would be a movie that is based on a novel. So a writer wrote a novel and then a production company decided to shoot a movie based on that novel. So the movie itself will be a derivative work. <clears throat> and the derivative work, they require that the original work author, owner, gives consent, gives a permission to someone make that derivative work. Okay? And, okay, let's say the movie was uh, produced, and then now there are several uh, merchandise related to that movie. So you have, let's say, bookmarks, you have posters, calendars, everything else. Those would also be derivative works because they came from, they, they are based on a, this pre-existing uh, novel. So that is uh, also important to, to know. Uh, moving on, so once you have your work, your mind creation in tangible form, we can say you have a copyright. You are a copy, copyright holder or owner. So how long is your copyright uh, valid for? So generally, it is valid for the life of the author plus 70 years, seven zero. So the heirs could be, let's say, children or whoever the heirs of the author will be, they will inherit the copyright of up to 70 years after the author passes away. If we're talking about works for hire, so for a good example here would be an employee being paid for so an employee working for a company and creates uh, a lot of original work that will be protected by copyright but then this uh, work because it's for hire it is the life of author plus 95 years okay and something interesting here is there was, uh, there is this act uh, called the Copyright Term Extension Act. Uh, this act was passed by the American Congress in 1998. So this act extended copyright protection by 20 years for works that were created after January 1st, 1923. And it is said that this act passed because of uh, Walt Disney had a big uh, lobby uh, their their copyright protection on Disney's characters uh, was about to expire so was set to expire in 2003 so they were pushing for a law to extend protection and then they, they managed it and now Mickey Mouse, uh, for example, uh, is still protected by copyright and the protection will expire in, in about two years, uh, almost uh, three years from now. So copyright protection was extended. And see, after this time is gone, what happens? That work goes in what is called public domain. So it goes into public domain. And when it is in public domain, anyone can use without the need to ask for the author's authorization, without the need to eventually have to pay the uh, copyright holder, uh, copyright fees, uh, use fees, etc. Uh, moving on. So now we look at um, copyright notice and registration. Well, Copyright protection actually is automatic. Once you have your creation in a physical form, in a tangible form, it is protected. You don't need to publish. 
All you need is to have it in a tangible form. So you just took a picture. That picture is only with you. You have not published, you have not posted. It's with you, but that picture is protected. You have copyright over it. If you publish it, you still have copyright protection. And when you publish it, or when you finish your website, des uh, website design or development, and you publish it, it is advisable, but not mandatory, but it's highly recommended to have a copyright notice. And the copyright notice would be something that has the name, such as here, Facebook, and then the symbol for copyright and the year. So it is a good practice to be updating every year this copyright notice. So whenever you log on to a website, you will see the company name, this, you may see the company name, this copyright symbol, and the current year. So it means they are updating every year at least the copyright notice. It means they have not forgotten. And why would you decide to go for a copyright notice? Well, it is not mandatory, it is voluntary, but the good thing here is that you are putting others on notice. So you are informing the general public that this work is an original one, or at least it was original when it was created by you, and it is protected by copyright. So if someone else uses this protected work without the author's consent, either paying or not, but without the author's permission, consent, they will be infringing. They will be violating the author's uh, copyright rights. <clears throat> okay? So even though it's voluntary, it's highly recommended. Uh, registration. Registration is also voluntary. And why is it voluntary? Well, I told you before, or I just told you. Once you have your original work in tangible form, in physical form, it is automatically protected. So you don't need to register it to enjoy protection. However, you may register it. And again, as a good practice, you should register it. Why? Well, first of all, if you want to sue someone else for copyright infringement, one of the prerequisites will be to have your copyright registered. So if you have not registered it, you will not be able to sue for copyright infringement. Uh, yet, the Copyright Act, the copyright law, will uh, give you or will permit you to seek for statutory damages. So damages that are already determined in the law. But those statutory damages, they are only available if you have registered your copyright. If you have not registered, you would eventually be seeking for the actual damages you suffered. And in most cases, or in several cases, it is very difficult to assess the actual damages suffered by copyright infringement. So let's say you had a picture, that picture was used without your consent. What damage did you suffer? It could be um, a few dollars, let's say $10, but it could be thousands of dollars, could be millions of dollars. How would you prove this? So it would make proving the actual damages a bit difficult. Whereas if you go for statutory damages, you could get up to uh, 30,000. Sometimes courts under their discretion could bring it up uh, to about 150,000 US dollars. So again, advisable to register. You can also recover your legal costs, which are usually uh, high. Attorney's fees, also high. And if you have no issues 
no problems with infringement, at least with registration, you have established a public record that you created that original work and you are the owner of the copyright of that work. So it is, again, highly recommended to register, even though um, it is not mandatory. It is not needed for you to have uh, copyright protection. Okay, where would you register it? You would register with the Copyright Office, either in the US or uh, in Canada. Uh, one thing that is important and I missed uh, to tell you in the first uh, slide, intellectual property, they are national in scope. So each country will have their intellectual property system and laws. They are very similar to one another. Also, there are several international treaties and conventions that try to uh, make them similar to one another. However, if you want protection in several countries, you have to follow the requirements of those several countries. Not for copyright, because we will see um, conventions and treaties, they provide copyright holders international protection as well but for patents for example if you want a protection by patent for your invention you have to file a patent application in each and every country you want protection so this is what i mean by national in scope um, you apply in each country you want protection and then you may uh, you may uh, wonder, well, if I want protection all over the world, about 200 countries, I would need to apply in all those countries? Yes, you would need to apply in all those countries. And guess what? Because countries have countries are um, have their sovereignty, they have their own powers. Some countries may grant your application. Other countries may say, no, I'm not granting for different reasons. So that's why there are international conventions. There's a World Trade Organization trying to harmonize this system. But there isn't international patent, international copyright, international trademark. Not yet. Again, there are systems that help, that facilitate registration application in several different countries could be at the same time or following a specific procedure but you need to seek protection for your own right in each and every country okay so that is very important but why did i mention this i mentioned this because if you want protection for your copyright and if you created copyright in the us you will Sorry, not if you want protection, sorry. If you want to register uh, your copyright uh, because you understand the advantages. So if you want to register it in the US, you will register with the US Copyright Office. In Canada, you will register with the uh, Canada Canadian Copyright Office and so on and so forth. All right, so let's look a little bit at the defense. And why do we touch upon defense? Well, if, um, if you want to sue someone that allegedly infringed your copyright, they may want to defend themselves. Or if you are sued because allegedly you have infringed uh, someone else's copyright, you may um, use, you may defend yourself. And, uh, before I talk about the fair use, it's important to talk about uh, two other defenses. And one is here, I'll be back here, but this uh, defense known as first sale doctrine. So this is interesting because let's say um, if you buy a book, if you buy a hard copy, a hard copy book, so you go to a bookstore and you purchase your book. So the first sale doctrine says that because you have purchased the book, you can now resale, resell the book. 
you don't need to ask the author of the book or the publisher authorization to resell that book because when you purchased it you paid all um, all fees that would be related to uh, copyright so uh, used uh, books which is the best example here uh, sale they are legal uh, what um, you could not do is to make copies of the book and then sell no the first sale doctrine says so you are the purchaser you purchased one book you pay the price that was uh, being offered by and then now you can resell let's say you used already or you don't need anymore etc so this is the first sale doctrine once you made your purchase for resale you don't need the author's authorization Okay. Another one that I'm not mentioning here, but when the original work falls or goes into public domain, so after the author's life plus 70 years or 95 years, that work has gone into public domain. Uh, many, if not all, uh, Shakespeare's plays, they are in public domain already. So you can uh, do virtually whatever you want with those plays because they are in public domain you don't need to ask uh, anyone's uh, license or pay any fees to anyone okay uh, but the one that is mostly uh, discussed and litigated about is the fair use uh, defense so this means that uh, the defendant the wrongdoer allegedly violated copyright, allegedly infringed uh, copyright uh, rights. But in their defense, the wrongdoer is saying, well, but I had a fair use. I made a fair use of that content. But what is to make a fair use of a copyrighted content? So courts, um, in this case, uh, Harper and Roe Publishers versus uh, Nation Enters, courts said that if you take an original work that is copyrighted, but to, to criticize it, so let's say a new movie, a new film, and you are a um, critic uh, commentator for uh, movies, new movies, so you can, you can criticize the movie and you can use images of it you are not infringing the copyright of the uh, studio or of the production company when you are criticizing, when you are commenting on it. Or if you are um, reporting news, you are also, uh, sorry, you are, not you are not violating copyright either. Uh, teaching is a good example. Research. So let's say if I, if I get here one page of a book, all books are copyrighted. I'm just sharing that one page with you, or if I'm sharing something with you that is copyrighted, but I'm using for um, for study purpose, for teaching purpose. That is fine. That is okay. But there are uh, on the top of those um, acts, on the top of those ways of using copyright material content without violating the copyright holders uh, rights uh, courts in general they will look at four factors so the first one will be the purpose and character of the of the use so the person or company who allegedly violated the copyright did they use for commercial nature or non-commercial nature just for some just for research or just for comparison so if it is for commercial uh, nature or objective, uh, fair use will be uh, less heavy here. So this person or this company will have a less strong defense because this company or person, they were commercially benefiting from a copyrighted content. So in this case, the purpose and character of the use would hardly fall into the fair use defense. So the more commercial, the more you make benefits, 
mostly financial, monetary, the less you can rely on the fair use defense. Also, the nature of the work, the nature of the work that either the company or the person has allegedly violated. So the more the content is related to uh, facts, the better it is. The uh, stronger the fair use defense will be. The more the work is fictional, and fictional here would be more created, more human mind created, then the less you can rely on the fair use. Also, there's the aspect of amount of the work. So how, how much of the work was used? So again, let's say here, I'm using for teaching. Let's say the publisher informs me that the textbook for this course will not be available after, until after the first or second week. And we need to cover, let's say, chapters one and two before the book is available. So I could make a copy of those. I would be using for teaching and I would be using only 10, 20% of the content um, to make available for free. You would still need to purchase the textbook. So the amount, quantity, also quality uh, will also be taken into consideration. In my example, I would probably be successful in my defense if I said, no, I only made copies, copies of chapter one or one and two because I needed to start the course. The academic year has set dates, etc. The publisher had informed me the textbook would be available only two weeks later. And that did not prevent students from purchasing the textbook and paying uh, the proper price. Okay. And also the economic impact of the use. So the less I have, again, it, it, it also, um, it's kind of related to the first factor. So the more commercial benefits I have, the less I can rely on this defense. But the less economic impact uh, or negative, negative economic impact I cause uh, to the copyright uh, holder, owner, the better it will be for me, the more I can rely on the fair use defense. Okay, so in general, when people or companies, they are sued for allegedly having violated copyright, they will try to rely on this fair use factors. They will try to fit their use into those four um, categories saying that, no, even though I used the copyright work, I was under the fair use uh, factors uh, determined by uh, courts. Or I was using for criticism or for uh, commentary, uh, it was a news uh, reporting, etc. Okay, those would not be infringing. Uh, trans uh, transformative use, also uh, <clears throat> you can use a uh, copyright, copyrighted material in a way that will differ from the original use, but how will it differ? Well, the way you are using the copyrighted material will actually come out with a different uh, type of expression, different meaning, or a different message. So whenever the, the expression or meaning or message uh, is new, using a copyrighted material, then you are not infringing. Uh, the best example here would be a parody. So you make a parody of a rap. So there was, there's a rap, a song, uh, rap style. And then you make a parody or uh, yeah, parody of, of this rap. So you are not infringing a copyright here because what you are doing is not a rap. You are not copying a rap. You are not copying the song. You are actually making a parody. And a parody, you are making it out of a rap. 
but the rap, um, the main message, the main expression of the rap doesn't exist anymore because now the focus will be on the uh, parody. Uh, good. So first, uh, say doctrine we discussed already. Uh, now let's look at the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, it is uh, only available in the US. The purpose of the DMCA is to protect copyright owners and also to uh, respond or to provide tools uh, to this increase of popularity and usage of digital content. So videos, songs, files. And what is very interesting here with the DMCA is the uh, safe harbor provision. So the safe harbor provision will allow websites or any ISPs, ISPs mean, uh, meaning internet service providers. So we will allow them um, to avoid liability for copyright infringement after they receive a what is called DMCA complaint. So let's say I am YouTube and one of the users of YouTube, they upload a film and this film is copyright protected. So this person uploading that film, uh, either just a part or the full film, is clearly infringing the producer's um, copyright. So the production company would just file a complaint, this DMCA complaint, uh, with YouTube, and then YouTube would remove that content. So it means that responding uh, in a positive way for such complaint, uh, YouTube would not suffer um, any liability for infringement because it was not uh, YouTube who caused, uh, which caused uh, that infringement attempt. And this was uh, decided in this Viacom uh, versus YouTube uh, case. Uh, very interesting one. And um, it's very, you could uh, read a bit more about it uh, <clears throat> in terms of this uh, safe harbor protection. Uh, so now, uh, the last part is looking at the international enforcement of copyright. So as I told you, all types of IP, they are national in scope. So I created my copyright, my original work in Canada, so it is automatically protected in Canada. I do not need to register, I don't need to register either. Uh, it has to be in physical format or tangible form. But what if I want protection in the US as well, in Mexico too, in Europe, some countries in Europe or all countries in Europe. So how do I have it protected there? I would need protection in each and every country. The good news here is that I don't need to register everywhere. Specifically for copyright, I just need to register in my country, the country where the original work was created. So I send a registration here to the Canadian uh, Copyright Office. Once it is accepted, because of the Berne Convention, I have protection. Uh, I have foreign uh, protection. I have protection in all countries that are signatory, that have accepted the Berne Convention that have signed the Berne Convention. So again, it doesn't mean I have an international copyright. Copyright is national only. However, I have foreign protection because of the Berne Convention. Canada is part of the Berne Convention. US as well, several other countries. So every country that is part of the Berne Convention, they say that your foreign copyright, your foreign registered copyright, is also protected here in our country. We have another convention that is called the Universal Copyright Convention. So this convention says that 
whichever protection a country gives to their citizens, their nationals, they also have to give to foreigners. So citizens, nationals and foreigners, they will have the same copyright protection. So no differentiation in treatment for citizens and nationals versus foreigners. And another important um, international agreement, this one is called agreement, but um, <clears throat> it could be understood as um, a convention too. So the TRIPS agreement has two main important aspects, not only two, but two main, two key important aspects. One is that the TRIPS agreement uh, set the minimum standards for uh, intellectual property protection. So the TRIPS agreement says, hey countries, if you are part of WTO, World Trade Organization, your intellectual property laws, copyright acts, patent act, trademark act, etc., etc., all IP uh, laws, they have to meet those minimum standards. Okay? So that's the first um, key characteristic. And the second key characteristic is that if any country believes that another country is not applying in their laws those minimum standards or are not complying, that country is not complying with the TRIPS agreement in any other way, they can file a dispute settlement with WTO. And then WTO in their panel, they will judge whether the complainant is right or the complaint country is right. The good example here is uh, back in 2007, the U.S. filed a complaint versus uh, against China, uh, claiming that China was not uh, complying with the TRIPS agreement. So this is what I wanted to share with you with regards to the international enforcement uh, of copyright. So summarizing this chapter, we looked at the definition of intellectual property. We very briefly saw four types of intellectual property, um, copyright, trademark, patent, and trade secret. And then we went deeper and further into copyright, which is the main topic for this chapter. So I told you what it is, what it protects. Protection is automatic. Notice is not mandatory, is, is only voluntary. Um, registration also voluntary, not mandatory. Once your creation is in physical form, it is protected already. But I also shared with you advantages of having the notice in your work, but also to register your creation. And we discussed about the validity, how long protection, copyright protection uh, stands for. Uh, we also looked at uh, defenses, uh, mainly the first sale doctrine, public domain, so after copyright expires, and then the fair use defense. We looked at the four factors, um, just very briefly. Uh, reminding the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the work, the amount that you used of that uh, work, and also the effect on the market, uh, mainly the commercial effect. And we also uh, saw that we can criticize, we can comment, uh, we can use for news reporting, uh, for teaching, for study, for research, copyright content without um, asking the copyright owner for perm permission. And we finished the chapter talking about uh, two aspects, the uh, DMCA, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, focusing mainly on the safe harbor protection, 
for internet service providers and websites. And fin the final point was the international uh, enforcement protection of copyright based on the Berne Convention, the Universal Copyright uh, Convention, and the TRIPS Agreement. Okay, so I'll see you um, in the next chapter. Thank you.